colleagues. We, we've created a pretty cohesive team to the point where we now meet on Zoom every Wednesday at one o'clock, which is seven, seven, seven o'clock for Emmanuel and eight in the morning for Keith Knox, who's also on the call. Uh, and so we're going to, Emmanuel's gonna talk about the, some of the work that some of what he's been able to recover from two different manuscripts that we've worked on in the last several years. Uh, the one we just worked on in the last few months. And uh, this is a, a relationship or a, a collaborative effort that's gonna continue. We have plans to go to be with him and Victor Geisenberg, who's also on this call in Paris for pretty much the whole month of June. They have 594 manuscripts, right? Or 594 leaves, I shouldn't say 594 manuscripts for us to image in that time. So I'll, uh, without further ado, I'll took a, turn it over to Emmanuel. Thank you, Roger. Um, hello and uh, welcome everyone. First and foremost, I would like to thank the hosts of this seminar and especially uh, Roger Easton for his kind uh, invitation and introduction. I'm currently working at Sorbonne Université with uh, Victor Chisonbert, who I have also spotted in the audience in a number of projects on Greek and Latin palimpsests. And what I'm presenting here is in many regards also his work. Today, I'm going to talk about ongoing research on two late antique palimpsests we are currently studying in close collaboration with other specialists, namely in the field of multispectral imaging. And who says multispectral imaging says Rochester. So I'm very happy to be here with you. You have probably already heard about St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. It was built around the middle of the sixth century AD and is the oldest continuously inhabited monastery in the world. Its library is very rich in old manuscripts written in a number of different languages spoken in the ancient and medieval Near East. Many of these are palimpsests and have been imaged by the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library on numerous campaigns. Somewhere between the 9th and the 11th century, a text in ancient Syriac, a language close to Arabic, that was once widespread in Syria, was copied um, uh, onto recycled parchment. This text is a translation of an ascetic guide for monks, originally written in ancient Greek and entitled The Ladder of Paradise. It was an enormously influential text in the Byzantine East, written by an early medieval author called John of the Ladder, or Ioannis Climax in Greek. Wherefore, the palimpsest bears the, name, the Latin name Codex Climaci Rescriptus, or the rewritten re Codex of John of the Ladin. It is easier for us to use the acronym CCR. CCR was unbound and parts of it left the monastery towards the end of the 19th century under unknown circumstances and were sold to different collectors in Western Europe. In 2012, the vast majority, that is 137 folios, entered the collection of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC. One leaf remains in the Mingana collection in Birmingham and eight in St. Catherine's Monastery. The undertexts stem from several late antique manuscripts and contain texts in Christian Palestinian Aramaic, the language Jesus spoke, and ancient Greek. Today, we will only look at leaves containing fragments of pagan Greek texts. These nine folios, so we are here, um, come from one single manuscript, a manuscript dated to the fifth or sixth century AD that contained three originally independent texts that had been rearranged in a peculiar way. So we have a first in the originally independent text that is Aratus appearances. And after the section describing one um, uh, constellation, um, they added a totally different text on uh, star lore, 
written by Eratosthenes, and then even a, another totally different text, which is our star, star catalog. So on the only unedited uh, part of this Codex Clima Scriptus today is actually the star catalog. And then I'm only going to talk about this uh, text here. Whereas most of the uh, theological parts in Aramaic and Greek were already edited back in 1909 in a book by the Scottish scholar Agnes Smith Lewis, a pioneer of manuscript studies uh, in St. Catherine's Monastery, the Greek copy of Aratus with commentaries remained hidden below the, uh, the Syriac upper text. It was only after the acquisition of the main bulk of the palimpsest uh, pages by the Museum of the Bible and the subsequent invitation to Tyndall House in Cambridge to take responsibility for its undertexts that the Aratus was discovered. In 2017, the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library the Lazarus Project and the Rochester Institute of Technology imaged the manuscript and processed the images thereafter. Peter Williams of Tyndall House initiated and participated in two independent research projects that led recently to two articles, these two here. I was only involved in the second one. The first gives the text of the fragments of Aratus with its commentaries as far as it is readable. Because Aratus' poem and Eratosthenes' mythological commentary are already well-known texts, the explanations of the scholars are succinct. The unedited fragment of Hipparchus' star catalog, on the other hand, needs more detailed comments, which are provided in the second article. Hipparchus was an astronomer from Nicaea in the northwestern corner of modern Turkey. He made his observations for the star catalog probably on the island of Rhodes around 129 BC. These were naked eye observations assisted by some primitive instruments about which not much is known. As far as we know, he was the first man to compose a star catalog. Nevertheless, the story goes that when the young prince and future emperor Marcus Aurelius, who was also a very learned philosopher, had a chat with some citizens of Hyde hometown about 250 years after the famous astronomer's death, they didn't know him. Marcus Aurelius was so enraged about their ignorance that he imposed a, a heavy extra tax on the city. The Nicenians then started issuing coins showing their most famous citizen on the reverse, but this didn't help. They had to pay the extra tax for almost 200 years. So you're lucky enough to hear about Hippocrates today. The fragments of the commented Aratus edition in CCR are in many passages very hard to read, and especially so in the Hipparchus sections, because we have many numbers there. Words, on the other hand, are easier to supplement, even if one cannot read them completely. This means that so far we have only been able to decipher Hipparchus catalog entry for one constellation, namely Corona Borealis or Northern Crown. We are hoping to discover more fragments in currently unreadable sections in the future, but what we already have is the first fragment of Hippocles catalog in its original language, ancient Greek, and enough text to definitely prove the existence of this work. I am showing you a part of the Corona Borealis section in a natural light color photo. There are faint traces of Greek letters at the beginning, but all in all, you don't see much. So here you can see some faint traces of Greek letters. This image processed by Keith Knox shows the undertext in a reddish color. So you see much more text here. It was mainly on this image that we read the Hipparchus text. In order to document our readings and to exchange new insights between members of the research group, I traced the letters in Adobe Illustrator. 
This method has also the great advantage that you can easily switch between different superposed images when some letters are visible only in one image, but not at all in the others and vice versa. Our text of Hipparchus entry on Corona Borealis looks like this. What Hipparchus actually does is indicating the positions of the northern, southern, eastern and westernmost star and thus the boundaries of Corona Borealis. He used equator coordinates instead of ecliptic coordinates as his successor Ptolemy, whose star catalog has been entirely preserved. So we see here a modern map of Corona Borealis and you see the uh, uh, some kind of circle uh, which uh, represents the crown. And um, um, Hipparchus gives four um, coordinates for four stars. So for the northernmost star, here the, um, um, the text is not um, entirely readable. And then um, he gives the um, coordinate of the westernmost star, um, which is the first that rises um, on the horizon, so the, the, the westernmost star. And he says that um, it is next to the bright one. So this is the bright one, by far the most bright star in this uh, constellation. Then he um, mentions the southernmost star, which is um, Delta. And what is interesting here is that he uh, uses a, an inclusive counting. So he begins, he says, it's the third star um, towards the east uh, from the bright one, but he counts the bright one already as first star. So it's one, two, three. And then he mentions um, the a last star is this, um, Iota Corona Borealis, um, which is the last to rise. So these um, indications are very accurate. And uh, you see here um, the uh, equatorial uh, equator coordinates he uses. So this is the equator and he gives the angle, but not this green angle here, um, instead, he uses the angle um, that goes down from the north uh, celestial pole, so the so-called co-declination. This is uh, we don't do this anymore today, but but he uh, he, he he did this, and you see um, the ecliptic, which in a in an alternative um, system was also used as starting point for the um, declination. And here you see the four figures we find in um, Hipparchus star catalog for Corona Borealis. Um, it is a very minimalistic way of indicating the positions of the stars because he gives only the co-declination for the northern and the southernmost stars and only the um, ascension for the western and easternmost stars. And you have to know uh, another thing, um, that is that um, for the ascension, he gives, he uses a peculiar way of of um, uh, for for the for the for the for, for the for the arc, because um, he does not say two hundred ten degrees thirty minutes, but Scorpius thirty minutes. This means you have to add. Um, 210 degrees to Hipparchus figure. Also in the case of the Iota star, he says it's 10 degrees and 15 minutes instead of 220 degrees and 15 minutes because uh, Scorpius um, represents a, a section um, on the equator, namely the section between 210 degrees and 240 degrees. While we hope to read further Greek fragments of Hipparchus star catalog in CCR in the future, we can now be sure to have three other fragments, namely of Ursa Major, Ursa Minor and Draco, in a Latin translation called Aratus Latinus. In the first half of the 8th century AD, 
someone in northern France had another copy of exactly the same edition of Aratus with commentaries by Eratosthenes and Hipparchus as the one recently discovered in CCR. While his Greek manuscript is lost, this man fortunately translated it into Latin. Unfortunately, he was not very proficient in Greek and his translation is sometimes hard to understand. He himself seems to have been aware of that because he gave up translating the Hipparchus sections of his model after the first three constellations. Therefore, only three fragments of the star catalog have been preserved there. At last, we have to discuss our attribution of the fragments of a star catalog found in CCR and in Aratus Latinus to Hipparchus because no manuscript is explicitly ascribes them to him. The attribution relies on three arguments. First, they are not exactly identical with the coordinates given in Ptolemy's star catalog, which is the only other catalog of classical antiquity still extant. You can see this in the table. So you have here, the first two columns are the um, figures um, given by Hipparchus. And in the column three and four, you have um, the figures given in Ptolemy's Almagest, which are slightly different. Second, Ptolemy says that he used Hipparchus' star catalog when working on his own. Therefore, we know that such a work existed and that Ptolemy could still use it almost 300 years after the death of Hipparchus. Third, due to the precession of the equinoxes, um, the position of the stars slightly changes over the course of centuries for the observer on Earth. If you used Hipparchus' star catalog today, you would not find the stars at their place anymore. But if you recalculate um, the position of the stars, as it was about 129 BC at Hipparchus' time, Hipparchus' figures are astonishingly precise. Hipparchus is therefore, with very high probability, the author of the star coordinates indicated in CCR and Aratus Latinus. I have summarized the complicated textual tradition of the star catalog in a diagram. Now let's move on to the second half of my paper. The Biblioteca Capitolare in Verona, Italy, claims to be the oldest continuously operating library in the world. Last May, Victor and I conducted a two-week campaign there in collaboration with engineers and multispectral imaging specialists of the Early Manuscripts Electronic Library and the Lazarus Project. Our goal was the photographic documentation of the Panamsis pages in Veronensis 40. Um, this is a, an 8th or a 9th century copy of uh, the Moralia in Job by St. Gregory the Great, an early medieval pope. Part of this work was written on Palimpsest pages from four late antique Latin manuscripts. First, a Virgil with commentary, the only witness of the so-called Scolia Veronensia. Second, a Livy. Third, the only fragmentary copy of a translation of Euclid's elements into Latin. And fourth, a hitherto unidentified and unedited philosophical treatise. In what follows, I will be focusing on this philosophical text. At the beginning of the 19th century, two late antique Latin palimpsests from the Verona Library attracted the attention of scholars. On the one hand are Veronensis 40, which we imaged in May, and on the other, the Veronensis 15. In order to understand the dawn of palimpsest studies in Verona, you have to know two points. First, the Veronensis 15 is the single most important manuscript for legal history. It contains a beginner's textbook on Roman private law by the Roman jurist Gaius entitled Institutions. It is the only almost entirely preserved work on Roman private law 
that antedates the famous late antique law collection initiated by Emperor Justinian, and De Veronensis 15 is the only manuscript. Second, palimpsests in Verona were a German affair until the end of the First World War, with one notable exception, Angelo Mai's edition here, uh, of the commentary on Virgil that has only been preserved in our Veronensis 40 palimpsest. Although the German scholars were originally mainly interested in the Gaius, they eventually also turned to our Veronensis 40. In both cases, they made heavy use of chemical reagents to make the undertext more visible, frankly stating it in their publications because it was the common method at the time. There were different types of reagents. In Verona, they used almost exclusively oak gall and Gioberti's tincture, or a mixture of both. Considering that those scholars did not have UV light and not even natural electric light at their disposal, not to speak of multispectral imaging, we should not chastise them too harshly for this invasive reading method. Yet the consequences were sadly disastrous, especially in the case of the two Verona manuscripts, where a number of scholars applied reagents in several layers which have completely darkened the palimpsests in many areas. We have not encountered this phenomenon in CCR, which fortunately spent the early 19th century in the isolation of Mount Sinai. In European libraries, on the other hand, we find a large number of palimpsests that have suffered a fate similar to that of our two Veronese man manuscripts, although the results are normally somewhat less harmful. What is remarkable in the case of the Veronese palimpsests is that the German scholars were not shy of telling that they had used reagent and what type they had chosen. In most other cases, modern scholars can only guess when and by whom reagents were applied. Especially informative is Friedrich Blume's report. During the summers of 1821 and 1822, I worked on Gaius again. After the work done by, my, by uh, my predecessors, it was to be expected that without new chemical help, almost no gleanings would be possible. And since repeated applications of pure oak gall tincture was of hardly any way, and liver of sulfur, not more as in Gershon's case, I used foremost Gioberti's mixture of Acidum muriaticum and Prusiet uh, of potash, which Peyron had made me familiar with. After long and varied experiments, I came to the conclusion that this means gives the best results if added in very low dosing to the alcohol solution. However, it can only be used on the smooth side of the parchment, and even here it darkens heavily if applied too often. On the rough sides of palimpsests, which are numerous in Gaia's fourth book, I achieved very little, even in combination with alcohol tincture. In the next uh, um, phrase, I can't read on my screen, but um, you can, and I'm sure you understand what he means there. Um, he had some second thoughts um, in uh, uh, the fourth volume of his Iter Italicum. And he writes there, Gioberti's tincture should be composed according to his specification of six parts of water, one part of acidum muriaticum, and one eighth of pusit of potash. Although these ratios can be carefully changed a bit according to the circumstances and with due diligence. When using it, avoid first and foremost rubbing of any sort. Peyron dipped entire pages into the tincture and immediately afterwards laid them into water. I carefully applied it with a brush and dried the area up after a few seconds by putting a cloth on it, because you cannot allow, uh, allow the tincture to dye the parchment once it has penetrated the remains of the old script. You also prevent the dangerous dyeing of the manuscript by combining it with oak gall tincture. And yet, be careful not to reiterate the procedure too many times on the same spot. After some years, however, everything seems to darken. 
Apparently, he became aware of the disastrous long-term effects of this method, and it is unlikely that it was still applied in Verona after the 1820s. The reagents are therefore about 200 years old. Now let's turn to the so far unidentified philosophical text in the Veronensis 15. While examining the first images taken with the multispectral camera in Verona, I deciphered on uh, folio 334v the three words quoque mediocres census, even mediocre incomes. This sequence of words was so specific that I could hope for a quick and reliable identification. A few checks later, it was clear that this was a text preserved in a single manuscript in the Vatican and edited for the first time only in 2016. So here is the Vatican manuscripts and you see the same words in a completely different script. Um, the publisher, Justin Stover, had attributed it to the Roman novelist and philosopher Apuleius, a native of Madaurus in present-day Algeria. It is a summary of Plato's dialogues from the viewpoint of a Roman imperial philosopher close to Stoicism. The attribution of the text to Apuleius is controversial among scholars, but does not need to be addressed here. We adopt the title given to this work in modern scholarship, Expositio. Of the 16 palimpsest pages of the Expositio preserved in Verona, two overlap with the text of the Vatican manuscript edited by Stover. The other 14 pages are unpublished fragments of the beginning of the treatise, which is not preserved in the Vatican manuscript. The writing is a very beautiful unsealed script, perhaps from the 6th century AD. It has no abbreviations or ligatures and is very regular, which helps in deciphering and filling in the gaps. I have lined up all the letters of the alphabet here. Um, <clears throat> on the slide next to each other and show my abstract drawings of the letters below. Tracing the letters is essential when working with difficult palimpsest texts. It allows you to approach the text slowly, to develop hypotheses regarding text supplements, to exchange with colleagues who can continue to work on the basis of a drawing, and to provide documentation for colleagues who do not work directly with the whole photographic documentation. Folio 322R contains the complete summaries of three short dialogues by Plato and the beginning of a fourth. You can see that the writing area of the deleted text of the Expositio has been cut off in the right margin here. I have indicated this by this red frame. So this is the uh, writing area. The multispectral images were processed by two specialists. Firstly, Roger Easton provided us with images that made it possible to decipher the letters drawn in black here. Uh, these uh, are one size fits all images. They are helpful for both the areas with and the areas without reagent. The title of the Platonic dialogue Ion is thus legible. Here's the Ion, here, Ion. As is the title Peri Aretes or On Virtue in Greek characters, it's here. This is either the alternative title of the dialogue Mino or the only title of the pseudo Platonic dialogue. On a slide, you see the title of the Mino besides its alternative title in an older dialogue, in an older edition of the dialogue. So you have here Mino or On Virtue. This way of indicating the main topic of a dialogue dates from antiquity, but was still common in the 19th century. So we do not know a priori which of the two dialogues or our author is talking about here. Then we read the Greek term rhapsodous, rhapsodists, here, rhapsodous. 
um, the letter Psi has a, a strange form because this copy was made at the very end of the bilingual ancient world and the shape of this Greek letter indicates that the copist had no real command of Greek. So he copied um, Greek letters in his uh, model, but he didn't understand them. Next, Keith Knox has provided us with a first image for areas not covered by reagents. This image allowed for the reading of the yellow letters. You see some yellow letters. It reveals the title of a third dialogue by Plato, the Theages. On the slide, you can see the differences between Roger's image here and um, Keith, and then my tracing. For the reagent covered passages, Keith has made a second image, which does not much help in areas with no reagent, such as the spot where I read the title of the Theagis. So the, the, the third image is the, the second image uh, provided by Keith Knox. Elsewhere, however, it allowed me to decipher the letters in Magenta, including the title of a fourth Platonic dialogue, Peridikayu, which means on the just. When deciphering this hybrid palimpsest, the Greek words can be quite challenging because the Latin and the Greek letters look in most cases the same. And you often do not realize at first hand that you are actually reading a Greek word. Here, for example, I had seen only an E on Roger's image here, the E, and assumed that it belonged to a Latin word, but couldn't make any sense out of it. Now, E looks exactly the same in both the Latin and the Greek alphabet. Keith's image finally confirmed that the first letter was actually a pi. So you, you'll see this pi-shaped uh, letter already here, um, in, in Roger's image, but it's, it's again here in, in, in Keith. And so you can be sure that it's really a, a pi. And this letter does not exist in the Latin alphabet. Once it has become clear that we are dealing with the Greek word here, the rest of the title can be traced with some difficulty. So it's peridikayu. It is important to know that on the chos is no alternative title indicating the topic of a dialogue, as in the case of the Mino, but the only title of this work. It is actually a very short, spurious dialogue that was not written by Plato, but circulated under his name. Therefore, it is possible that we must not identify the following dialogue on virtue with the Mino, but with another short, spurious dialogue on virtue. Now that we have carefully deciphered the text by combining Rogers and Keith images, we can conclude this Zoom seminar. Our drawing is finished and we have obtained an abstract but very precise documentation of the text that can be laid on a white background and will serve as a basis for further philological research. Thank you for your attention. Right there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Emmanuel. Bye. It, I tell you, it's really interesting to see the how he gets to the final result because I only see snippets of it as he's doing it. So that that was really interesting just for me. Do we have any questions of the public audience here? Because all right, do we have any questions online? I, I do have one thought that I would like to add. Um, one of the things that I think you can probably see here is the difficulty of recognizing those character shapes on the processed images, even with the substantial processing that we've done. And one of the things we really think is essential to pursue is some kind of uh, artificial intelligence or, intelligence or machine learning 
process to apply to this. And so that's one of the things that we're looking for input from people as to whether, uh, as to how we should go about doing that. So this is a process that is in, it's still ongoing. I just noticed there's a, might be some question in the chat. Okay. I can't. <laughs> Do you want me to try to get yeah, to that? Yeah, I can't. Oh, that's right. I'm, it's not, it's not here. So that's, that's why I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so Dave Messenger saying what would help, what would help with you to speed up the process of interpretation? Higher resolution or is it just challenging here? So Emmanuel, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I think it's just uh, challenging. I mean, um, if you look at, at this page, I mean, you see all the, the reagents um, and it's, it's very dark here. It's, it's almost black sometimes. And this is not the worst pace, um, to be honest. And um, in, the, in the case of the Hippocus um, palimpsest, on the other hand, it has been um, washed down very carefully. Um, and on the here you see almost nothing. I mean, you have to be, you look very carefully at the at the parchment um, to see that it is, it is actually a, a palimpsest. And, the, and even, even uh, Keith's uh, image doesn't show much. I mean, this was really a, a, a hard one. And, and there, there, are, there is no reagent here. And that's to me one of the very impressive things is that even if we can just give Emmanuel and Victor a little bit, they can often recover quite a lot. The process is sometimes, I mean, sometimes you just feel like you're pounding your head against the wall, but uh, they're often able to get something. Alexander wants to know a little bit more about the image processing techniques. Okay. Alexander wants to know about the image processing techniques, and of course, that's not Emmanuel's specialty. That's uh, more Keith than me. Keith is also on the. Keith, did you have something you wanted to say about that? Uh, which one in particular were they talking about for the uh, for the image processing? Uh, I would say address either one of them. Okay, well, the one that's showing right now, CCR, that was that was uh, several years back, and that was early on. And actually, the process that's shown there is the the old process we used uh, uh, way back with the Archimedes project. Uh, the ones, of course, the second half uh, we were talking about the the particular ones he was looking at, uh, PCA uh, being used against um, uh, different bands. Um, Sometimes is helpful, sometimes is not. Uh, in that particular case, uh, one of the ones he showed, what I did was to run the the bands that I was looking at through two different nonlinear processes. One of uh, uh, taking a logarithm of it, and then the second one uh, taking a um, applying an exponential to it, and. By using the slight differences, well, you can see there, that's a PCA with the ex exponential and log on the reflectance uh, images bands. Uh, and by comparing the two against each other, was then able to get color differences between uh, the um, undertext, the erased undertext, um, um, enough to be able to give a color contrast between the undertext and the um, the uh, uh, the rest of the document, uh, which then makes it a little more visible. So I would so those are some of the image processing things. PCA is one of the common ones. Sometimes we use band ratios, uh, taking ratios of them to try to suppress the overtext and make the undertext uh, easier to enhance. Uh, but otherwise, uh, with something like a statistical processing, introducing nonlinearities uh, helps to. Um, alter what it is that's being emphasized, and that sometimes can pick out under text well. The, the other thing I think I might add is we often do a pre-processing step, and I think this is one of the examples. 
the, if you recall from the, the reagent so severely darkens part of the image, but not so much other parts. So we do a pre-process and kind of, I think of it as sort of equalizing that. We blur the, all the bands individually uh, over a size bigger than a character. And then we ratio each band by its blurred replica. And so if you got a bright area, it, it will, you got a, uh, a bright area divided by a bright area, you'll get a, something that's a, with one ratio and you get a dark area divided by a dark area. You'll, you'll also get something that's approximately one. So it will tend to equalize the uh, contrast across the page. And then we'll take those and do some kind of process of principal components, or I often use minimum noise fraction. And one of the key issues uh, is which bands do you use when you do that? And this is one of the real positive aspects of having Keith and I work together, even though we're doing very different processing somebody makes an observation, Keith would make an observation which bands were useful for what he was doing. And then I would uh, apply my processing to that same set of bands. And sometimes that gives us a significantly improved result. Right, and I would make one more comment too. And that is in the areas that uh, Emmanuel was pointing out of a heavy reagent and they're very, very dark. The other thing that we did was to uh, emphasize and use some of the long wave measurements since the longer the wave and the infrared it it travels deeper into the into the uh, uh, into the parchment or in into the ink uh, and and then also use longer exposures uh, in order to try to capture the very faint differences between the undertext you want to read and this terrible background of of reagent uh, painted over it uh, to try and pull out. If you can't measure those slight differences, you you can't extract them. So uh, long way of uh, the infrared, the near infrared and uh, longer exposures was one way of trying to get after the stuff in the uh, reagent area. And this is, again, one of the benefits of doing the imaging and the image processing together, because the in Verona, the image pro imaging was done around the corner from the processing room when we were in Milan. It was almost the same room. And uh, so we were able to communicate to Ken Boyston and Damian Kazutaki and, and to Dale, Keith's wife, who were taking those images and uh, then modify the processing as we go. I guess I would say one more thing. The cameras that were used for these were completely different. The earlier images of the CCR, which were taken, I believe, in 2016, uh, that was with a 50 megapixel uh camera with a six micron chip the later images were the 150 megapixel with sony chip but we didn't shoot it 150 we binned it so we we had each pixel be a two by two which gave us roughly speaking four times the dynamic range which allowed us the hope was to allow us to see much smaller variations of contrast so we are actually modifying the way we do it kind of as we do it yeah, and don't forget, don't forget the scholars. The scholars, Victor and Emmanuel, were there as well. And by the fact that that they were sitting and looking at the results as we were producing them and as we were taking the data, uh, they could get their feedback into it, and we could make changes and try other things. Uh, that was absolutely invaluable. Absolutely, which is again part of the reason when we go to Paris, we're all going to be together again, doing exactly the same thing. So a uh, question about whether we should use a hyperspectral system. And certainly that's something we are talking about doing. And Dave Messenger is on the call. That's what he does. Uh, Dave, do you have a comment about that? Uh, just that it's still really hard. And I think that um, having more spectral information may be able to help but it really depends on the nature of the material. And, and until we try, I'm not sure we're gonna know. Yeah, and again, we need the dynamic range. You need yeah, you need dynamic range, but you also need the materials to have enough spectral contrast in some of the bands that you can pull that out, so. Yeah. Karen, you see any others? I can't, I can't see. <laughs> okay, any, any other questions either online or in the audience? 
Um, yes, I, I have a, a, a question for my side and um, for the audience. Um, do you have any idea if um, artificial uh, intelligence um, could be of any help? And, and, and if yes, uh, how? Um, because we are, we are uh, thinking about, um, um, yeah, making a second step and, and uh, trying uh, AI as well. And let's open that question up to the people who are online as well as the people who are in the room. So we have a we have a PhD student here who's working on an artificial intelligence approach to separating out layers of text in palimpsests, Anna Sternskaya, who I don't know if she's on today. Um, and it's also very challenging, right, just to be able to try to understand to have the the AI system learn the nonlinear function that's causing the mixing of the of the materials and then try to invert it is is very difficult. She's having some success, um, but nothing on anything that's this sort of obscured. Mm -hmm. um, could you please write your name in uh, into the chat, please? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Tony, uh, we do image uh, front and back. And on occasion, we've actually tried, and I think once or twice, we actually found it useful to register the front and back images using the uh, transmissive bands. We, we, we didn't talk at all about the way we collect the image, but we collect in, Keith did mention, we collect in transmission as well as in reflection and fluorescence. And by using those transmission bands, we can register the front and back and then try to get recovery. I remember doing this when we were at the Vatican and Nigel Wilson, who's a scholar that many of us know, uh, was sitting there and I worked really hard registering front and back and got him two characters. And he says, yeah, I can read them, but I knew what they had to be. <laughs> so, but yeah, so, so we do uh, try to do front and back on occasion. And just today, just earlier today, when we had our chat about the Verona processing, uh, the suggestion was made, maybe we should need to try that on one of those cases as well. Yeah, Roger, if I can comment on that. Sure. Uh, yes, yes uh, registering them, I think, is going to be very valuable. But even without being registered, uh, I've found that that by referring to the backside and looking at what the image looks like on that side helps me understand of what I'm seeing on the side I'm working on, whether that might be something that's coming through from the other side. If I find there's nothing there on the other side in the exact spot, then I realized it's I'm seeing something from from the side I'm working on. Um, so yes, uh, as a matter of fact, if we even if we're doing single pages on something, we do both sides of that page because it's uh, both sides of that leaf because it's you 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 you'll have questions otherwise that you can't answer. So you need to see both sides. And one other short addition to that being uh, skin, uh, parchment is made of animal skin. There's a, a flesh side where the inside and there's the outside where the hair was, the hair side. And those two sides have often completely different characteristics that require completely different process. The hair side is much tougher than the flesh side. So. I kind of enjoy this sort of, sort of open discussion. Uh, any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you again, Emmanuel. That was most illuminating, pun completely intended. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and as you probably all realize, it's now 1030 for Emmanuel, 1030 <laughs> in the evening. <laughs> so thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. Goodbye. So this is the kind of thing we do every other Friday. We have our archive.